According to your wish According to your wish My life is not my own My life is not my own I seek you in Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in the study that we started last week, which is actually in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. But it may seem like a little bit of a roundabout trip there. Because I think there are things that we need to do prior to going into that to give us a greater understanding as we go into it and study it. So last week we were talking about the imperative that we have to learn to change the way that we think. I mean, that indeed is what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Jesus Christ saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Because we were brainwashed or brain dirty is probably a better word, by those who unscrupulously led us in religious practice. So today we're going we're gonna to look, uh, this may seem a little bit strange, we're going to start our study in the Sermon on the Mount today by studying the letter to Paul's letter to the Galatians, because they are intimately connected. Uh, I, I don't know, have you ever played golf? Yes. Not very well. I was going to say that's a... <laughs> but if you go to a new golf course that you've never been to before, you know, somebody may warn you that, okay, when you get to this hole, you're going to find sand traps over here and sand traps over there. And I found them all. Yeah, indeed you did. <laughs> or if you're going to go fishing, and you get on a little boat to go out, somebody may tell you, you know, you got to be careful of the reefs over here or the reefs over here. The letter to the Galatians is going to be our letter of preparation and warning mm -hmm. as we go into the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Because as you'll see, the, the, letter, the letter to the Galatians is actually one of the most strict letters of correction yes. that there is to a church that was so completely filled with the Holy Spirit and then had chosen to kind of walk away from it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even consciously, you know, they were bewitched. Yes. Uh, but we have to understand that. We have to be on guard. We, and I, I will tell you, the Lord said to me, I, we have to be on guard, not to be on guard for the flock, right? Mm -hmm. I am indeed <clears throat> responsible for what I teach. So we're going to do that. And we're going to do that right after I just ask God's blessing. Father, we, our desire is to grow closer to you, to grow closer to your son, Christ Jesus, to be more like your son, Christ Jesus, to be molded and shaped by your word, Lord. We don't want to be deceived. We want, we want to be on track, Lord. We want to know the truth and abide in the truth. So I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart, Lord God, that we would see wonderful things in your word. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit, sent to lead us into all truth, would sound the warning any time that we start to stray from that truth. So we praise you and thank you, Father, and ask, Lord God, for your blessing on our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so as I said, we're going to uh, actually be in the letter to the Galatians today as part of our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Mm -hmm. If that doesn't make sense to you, I pray that it will before long. All right? So in Galatians chapter 1, now in Galatians, let me just say this, okay? It's not a church. Yeah. No, it's the churches in Galatia. Yes. That's, that's what it says in the second, second verse there, right? To the churches of Galatia. So unlike so many other letters that are to a specific church, this one is to a whole group of churches. Mm -hmm. Because that area of Galatia was kind of unique. The people there were unique. They were culturally unique. And uh, and unfortunately, they were unique in the errors that they allowed to grow and take place inside that group. And we want to be on guard against that. So it starts out, Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. You know, there's nothing wrong with being sent by men if that's the way God is leading. Right. Right? Absolutely. But there are certainly times that God will call and appoint people to ministry, not as a function of an existing church group, but just it's Him calling. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> I can attest to that. And like you've said before, the ordaining of someone in the church is just to recognize that God has called them. Amen. That's a good point. I mean, we, we tend to think of word ordination as so, us appointing, appointing and, and right. making, giving somebody the power and authority to do something. Right. That's not what ordination, ordination is. Ordination is recognizing the calling of God in somebody's right. life yeah. and then encouraging that person, mm -hmm. supporting and encouraging that person. All right? So, but that Paul is making that point. Mm -hmm. That his ministry comes not because he was selected by a group of apostles, not because a group of churches thought it would be good if he had that position, but it is specifically Jesus Christ and God the Father who had called him and appointed him to this task. Mm -hmm. So he's saying he's writing to the churches and to all, all, all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Again, there's just more than one church there, right? Mm -hmm. And he says to them, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Christ Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Do you know that you have to be rescued? I mean, you know, I, I don't know how we think of salvation, but salvation is us being saved from the destruction of the world and the world, the world system and the world forces, right? Salvation is us being rescued. Should be a real cause of celebration. When you said that rescued made me think of, for some reason, being on the water and being rescued, which made me think about in Hebrews where it says that Jesus is the anchor of our soul. Yeah, he was right. He's yeah. our hope, our only hope. Amen. <clears throat> So Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from the present evil age. I don't know how astute you have to be. I don't know how in tune with the Holy Spirit you have to be to recognize that this present age is evil. And grows more evil by the day. I and mean, that is indeed one of the signs of the last days. It's one of the signs of the times. It's not like it's stagnant. It's not like, it's not, well, it's always been this way. I'm 77 years old, I'm going to tell you something. It has not always been this way, no. by any means whatsoever. It grows increasingly dark day by day, right? I mean, verse 5 says, talking about now, because this is about God the Father, Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. God will share his glory with another. We need to be giving the glory and everything in our lives to the Lord God, to Jesus Christ and to the Father. But now, now remember, the Church of Galatia, and as you'll see, has been so gifted yes. with teaching on the Holy Spirit, with the working of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and yet now he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. In the King James it says, I marvel that you're so, so soon removed from that. Desert is the right word. Yes. You know, I talked about that in John chapter 6, when so many of Christ's disciples walked away from him because his word was too difficult. They were deserting. Yes. If you leave the true teaching of Jesus Christ, you are deserting him. They were going AWOL. Well, we're, yeah, absolutely AWOL. Without official leave. Yep. That's right. But deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Yes. You know, we have the gospel. Hallelujah. Do you know there are other gospels? There are many false gospels. Mm -hmm. Gospel comes from the Greek and it means good news. There, I'll tell you what, there's not an advertising agency out there that won't shout at you today and tell you they've got good news. Mm -hmm. You can now buy six of their products for the price of eight of their products or something. I don't know, that would be good news. <laughs> All right? And that's why he says, which is not really another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So there's not really another gospel. There's no other good news. There is the good news of Jesus Christ. All the rest is bad news. That's right. But Satan dresses it up like good news. Right? He disguises himself as an angel of light. He makes it pretty. Amen. So here it says, which is not, I'm reading the King James, it's not another, but there be some 
that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There's a difference between distorting it and perverting it. Yeah. Okay, you can distort it by just shifting it a little bit and shifting it a little bit. But perverting it, I mean, is, is a filthy thing. Yes. And it truly is. A false gospel, no matter how attractive it is, is a filthy thing. Mm -hmm. Because its design is to take you away and take you to a pit of death. So Paul goes on and he says this. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Let him be accursed. How strong, how strong a word is that from a man whose life is dedicated to reaching out because his desire is to see people saved. Right. And now he's saying, if you preach a different gospel, you need to go to hell. You need to go to hell. That's what he's saying. Contrary to what we have preached. If you don't recognize the fact that there are so many contrary gospels out there, because the good news of Jesus Christ is the Word of God. You can't pick and choose. You can't separate this little piece from that little piece. It's the whole, it's, you know, it's like you go into court and they say they want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You can take it apart little by little and make it turn a truth into a lie. We have to be on guard. We have to test the spirits because many false prophets have gone abroad. And there are many people out there dressed in very religious robes mm -hmm with thousands of Christians following their every word, hanging on their every word, who indeed are preaching a gospel contrary to what Paul, Peter, John, all the apostles to the gospel they preached. To the gospel that the Lord God has given you. Absolutely. So, you know, don't, don't be surprised. And he, he's saying, you know, it doesn't matter. Even if we are an angel from heaven, People say, well, that person, we know he has, he's a good reputation. He wouldn't have, you know. He's a good person. <laughs> Cursed is the man who trusts in man and in mankind in the flesh. That's what it says in Jeremiah. Says, but blessed is he who trusts in God, whose trust is in God, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that you, you are testing things according to the word. But in order for you to test things according to the word, you have to know the word. Right. That's why you have to abide in it. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 6, he said, if you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Free from what? Free from the lying tongue of that devil, the father of lies. And you have to believe what you read in the Word. You have to believe it. Yes. That's good. You have to believe it. You've got to believe it in your heart. That's right. Amen. You've got to confess it with your mouth. That's right. Amen. Then you've got to live it. you got to do it. Right. Yes, it's always free. You've got to believe it in your heart. You gotta confess it with your mouth, and then you gotta walk it with your feet. Amen. Don't don't misunderstand that, all right? So in verse nine, Paul says, "As we have said before, so I say again now: If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed." I am sad to say it's so strong. Uh, it's incredibly strong. Yeah. And Paul would not use such terms if it were not, he didn't feel it was absolutely necessary. And had he not been led by the Holy Spirit to say them. That's right. God said, you know, Jesus said that if, if, if you lead one of my children astray, it would be better for you if you put a millstone around your neck and threw yourself into the river and drown. There are. And that, and that too, I think, doesn't mean just little children. No. That means the children of God. We are children of God. And we are indeed the children of God. Yes. Amen. Right? Okay. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Amen. you got to make sure that that's the truth in, in your life. Paul said, listen, I mean, he's saying, if I were trying to please men, I couldn't be a bondservant of Christ. The goal is not to have people like you. Right. It's not. Absolutely. I mean, if you're faithful to the word, I tell you, a lot of people are not going to like you. That's that's a fact. That's just a simple fact. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Study to show yourself approved unto God. What's the result of faith in our life? Well, um, we get stuff. 
If we believe, we get stuff. We'll get this and we'll get that. And we, you know what you get? Go read Hebrews 11 too. What you'll get is the approval of God. By faith, men received approval. Not, not approval of men. Approval of God. Because if you read the whole 11th chapter, by and large, when you were walking in faith, the men, the world did not approve of you and they, they didn't treat you well, right? They hated Jesus. They're going to hate us. So now, the, let me just reiterate something. The reason we're talking about this now is because you need to understand that I hear these teachings on the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. It's about God wants to make you happy. God wants to bless God. God does want to bless you. But you better not be applying human terms to that. Right. Because he may bless you by leading you to a place of utter, absolute persecution. That's right. Just to, to, to speed up your transition to that place. That like a fiery and, oven. Or yeah, a, absolutely. A lion's den. So you, you need to have this in mind as we're going in, as we will go into the Sermon on the Mount. This has to be the attitude that we have. I, we're seek, not seeking the favor of men. We don't do things to seek the favor of men. We want to be pleasing to God. All right? And in verse 11, he says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation, a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, God has appointed teachers in the church. There is no doubt about it. And God has also told you, test them. Test the spirits. Many false prophets are going abroad. I don't know how many times I have said that over the course of the years as we've done these Bible studies. I said, don't trust me. Yeah. Test me. But test me according to the word of God. Not because you like the way I talk, not because you like the way I speak, not because you like my background. That, none of that matters. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is that I am speaking according to, rightly according to, the teaching of Jesus Christ and the Father. Because that's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that there are many out there, many, 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 who are not teaching that way. And I promise you one thing, they didn't receive that from God. There's a lot of teaching out there that didn't come from God. And then he goes on and he says, For you have heard my former manner of, in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But we're going to get into this thing about traditions. And I think, you know, in our introduction to this last week, we talked about that a lot. There's always this, there's always seems to be this conflict between the traditions of men and the commandments of God, right. which is what Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 7, when he says to them, you know, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God, hold fast to your traditions. How much of our life is according to tradition? And if you don't get that fixed in your head now, before we go into the Sermon on the Mount, because I will tell you that the teaching of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount basically attacks the traditions. The traditions of the church. Amen. Yes. Not the word of God. Not the right practice. Mm -hmm. But there are so many traditions in the church that don't simply do not line up with the commandments of God. Amen. All right. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. I mean, let me just take a look at this thing. God set him apart mm -hmm. from his mother's womb. Yes. Well, I don't know how exactly how old Paul was when he had that radical encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. But he wasn't a child. No. So for many years before, he was uh, a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee taught. He said uh, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, taught mm -hmm. by one of the greatest Pharisees of the age, Gamaliel, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, when he was doing all of the things that he thought were the things that God desired, when he was in the natural trying to please God, when he was on that road to Damascus, what did God say to him? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Because I want to tell you something, and we've talked about this. If, 
if somebody is persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, they are, perse they are persecuting Jesus Christ, and he takes it personally. You never walk alone, right? So, he didn't consult with flesh and blood. No, and no matter when you were saved, if you were saved, I, I want to tell you something. God, it's like he said to Jeremiah, he formed, said to Jeremiah, I formed you while you were yet in mother's womb. Your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundations of the earth. You may not have seen God's work in you, but God was working in you from inside your mother's womb until the moment you were saved. And then it just becomes obvious. Mm. It becomes, you know, and you become cooperative to it by praying. Yeah. So, he wants to reveal his son in you and I. Isn't that what it says? That our ministry is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. You know, thinking about that when he was uh, chosen from his mother's womb, right? Um, yes. It's like there was no choice. Well... God foreknew, you know, I mean, that... That's the predestination. Well, yes, that, whom he has foreknown, he it's is predestined. The, pro the problem is, uh, there are two thoughts in Christianity that are in pretty much in opposition to one another, yeah. to the point of let's go kill each other to, to determine it. Arminianism and uh, Calvinism. Right. You know, that you didn't have any choice. But if you didn't have any choice, over and over it says, you know, choose you this day, believe in us. Uh, so I'm, uh, so I'm, not gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to go there, but I'm going to say, yes, I, I believe yes. that you have to choose day by day, even if you are saved, that you're going to walk according to the Spirit of God. And those who walked away had the choice. Right? Uh, absolutely, they deserted. Mm -hmm. And again, that goes back to the same thing in John chapter 6. Yeah. So he said that when God was pleased to reveal his son in him, that he might preach him among the Gentiles. He didn't go and consult with flesh and blood. He didn't go to the he didn't go to people and say, "Am I doing right? Is this good? Is this yeah, right?" Yeah. He didn't go to Jerusalem mm -hmm. to meet with those who were apostles before him. When he went away, went into the desert and returned once more to Damascus. And three years later, it says in verse 15, 9, 18, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with, uh, with him for two weeks, 15 days. It's Peter. Yeah. Peter, yes, absolutely. Do you know that there are people that God has his hand on who is moving them and working through them? You may not recognize it until you pay attention to what they're saying. Mm. Because if you're going to test them, if you're going to see whether they are of God or not of God, it becomes a matter of what they are teaching. Yes. What they are preaching. So, but here now, it's it's years, literally right. three years later, he finally goes to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles, and he's, he who's he meet with? He meets with Peter and James, the Lord's brother, and he says, "Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia." I was not, still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once was persecuting us is now preaching the faith which he had once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Hallelujah. Yes. How many people glorify God because of what you're doing? Shouldn't that be our desire, our great desire? Shouldn't that be our goal? That should be. I was going to say that should be our goal. That God be glorified in everything that we do. Yes, but let me just tell you one thing: if you're trying to glorify yourself, or if you're trying to be glorified, you will never glorify God. God will not share His glory with another. So, but you should have that desire, no matter what you're doing. I mean, even in the Sermon on the Mount, we will get into that, where where Jesus says, you know, if you do good works, do them in such a way that men see them. A glorified God. God, not you. Yeah. Our focus has to be on Jesus Christ, on God the Father. Why do you think it says that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith? It's not about us. And that's something really, really important here as we get into Galatians to see, because here's a church, like I said, so early filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet, Paul says, why are you deserting? 
How can you turn your back on this? Because they were being misinformed. They were believing what was not true. They were accepting false gospels. And that's all it took. So let's go on to the next chapter there, right? So in Galatians 2, it starts, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. 14 years. 14 years. Well, I tell you what, he wasn't sitting home watching television during those 14 years. He was redeeming the time. He was doing the work of God. So it was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So you get the picture. One of the things we're talking about is the Jewish tradition of the law. Oh, exactly. right? The pagans, by and large, weren't bothered by Paul. No. I mean, they really weren't. They didn't care about spiritual things. Or, you know, they just, it, it wasn't that big a deal for them. Mm -hmm. Because they had hundreds of gods. Right. So, you know, it was like, that, that was one of the great causes of persecution in the early church. Was when Caesar said, you know, he demanded that he be called Lord. And the Christians said, no, we're not going to call him Lord. And the Romans actually couldn't understand that. Well, why not? It's just another God. Just another God. Yeah. No, he's not just another God. He is Lord. He is That's God. Right. And there is only one. All right. So, it was important for Paul to think to bring Titus with him, and even though he was a Greek, was not compelled to be circumcised. In other words, Paul did not make sure that, that Titus was, was put under the law. Put under the law. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful, because I'll tell you what, if you get put under the law, you're going to be obligated to stay under the law. Right. And the law can't keep you righteous. Yeah. I, I, let me, I've said this a lot of times, but I want to say it one more time. And, and if you've got a pencil and paper, write this down. Jesus Christ did not come into this world to start a new religion. No, he, did not. he came into this world to restore an old relationship. Amen. To reunite us with God the Father. And it's not about starting a new religion. It's not about coming up with a new set of rules <laughs> just to replace the old set of rules. Because Christianity is about one word, and that one word is love. And it's about the love of God. How do you know what the love of God is? We know God love by this. this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in our, in our place to take away that stain of sin. We have, to, we have to get really, really serious about this. And don't be persuaded. Don't be trapped. Don't be misguided about doing these things that you, the things that you think will make you right with God. There's only one thing that will make you right with God the Father. Only one. One and only one. That is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Now that doesn't mean Nothing that there are the that doesn't mean that there are things you're not you should not be doing. I mean you certainly should be doing things that, that are part of the Word of God. But they don't it's not they're not there to make you right with God. They are there to It's a result of being a child of God. And it's also that's the abundance of life. Is found in doing the things of God, obeying the commandments of God. Pleasing I mean, Pleasing the... I know a lot of people don't like this, but go read Deuteronomy 28 and find out what, what obeying him does for you. If you hear his voice and you obey his voice, Deuteronomy 28 says he will bless you. All over the place. He'll bless you in the city, he'll bless you in the country. He'll bless you coming in, he'll bless you going out. He'll bless your wife. He'll bless your children. He'll bless your kitty cats and puppy dogs. He'll bless the work of your hand. He'll bless everything about you. Absolutely everything. Yeah. And that's not like, okay, you've earned it, those blessings. It's like that's how you avoid missing the blessings. Because if you don't do what God has said, you will miss the blessings. Yes. Now, I said this, I think I said it last week, and I, I don't want to overdo it. But I mean, this may even sound very silly to you. But if somebody tells you there's a great blessing waiting for you down at the McDonald's over there, there's somebody out down at the McDonald's who's just giving away money, and you say, oh, I'm not, I want to get in on that. So you hop in your car and you drive to the Burger King because you like Burger King better than McDonald's. You're going to miss the blessing. And it's not because the person at the McDonald's did something and so oh, I'm It's because you chose not to do what God said. <clears throat> All of the instructions. This is the manufacturer's handbook. Obey the word of God. That's it. Hear and obey. 
I, I'm just going to go on to verse 4 here. We're going to not carry this on too long here. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. You need to get a hold of that. It was because of the false brethren. Now, that, the false brethren, that means they dress up right. They dress the same way. They, they may talk the same way. They may carry the same Bible that you carry. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing is yeah. exactly right. But they, they come in secretly in order to spy out the liberty that you have in Christ Jesus. You have liberty in Christ Jesus? Yes. It was for freedom that he set us free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. They want to bring you back and put they you. They want to take you there. back into bondage. All right, that is Satan's goal mm -hmm. to bring you back into bondage. Well, is not what it says. That's what it says. In order to bring us into bondage, you are either. Uh, I don't want to get anybody upset, but you're you're, you're a slave uh -huh. because you are either a slave to righteousness or, or a slave to sin. But you are a slave. You are a servant. And one of the titles that I use, and I pray that you are able to also, is I am a bond servant of the Most High God. That's right. I am. I God set me free. But then he gave me the option. He gave me the choice to come and choose to serve him freely because of my love for him in response to his love for me. Do you love God? Do you choose to serve him? I'm telling you, that's where the blessings lie. That's where the blessings lie. Oh, hallelujah. You don't want to go into bondage again. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Thank you, Lord. And that, that's what, I mean, that's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. That's what we're going to get into. When we get into the Sermon on the Mount, which is not far off here. But, like I said, we need to be conscious before we get into it that all of these things that are said in the letter to the Galatians are warnings about the, the pitfalls. I mean, these are spirit-filled people. Yes. These are people that God yes. brought the good news to miraculously and gave this. So why did Paul, in the next chapter, have to say, who has bewitched you? Oh, you foolish Galatians. Oh, you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? You know what? I'll tell you who. Satan. That's right. It's, it's not just... That false preacher out there on your television set, he's only a pawn. He's only a pawn in the hand of the evil one, the enemy of our spirit. So be on guard. Be on guard for yourself. Be on guard for the ones that you love. Amen. Be bold enough to share the good news. Be bold enough to call somebody to task if they are living outside of the will of God. And it becomes obvious, right? We want to find that total freedom. Like I said, Jesus Christ did not come to start a new religion. Jesus Christ came into this world. Well, you know what he said? He said he came into this world to die. That's right. For this reason, I've come into the world. To die, to take away the stain of our sin and make us free from the stain of sin. Every step he took Every step was a step to the cross. Headed for the cross. So, we need to find out the mind of Christ and have the mind of Christ. All of this came out of, you know, the comments we made at the beginning of this study well, a week ago, two weeks ago. It's about learning how to change the way that we think. Mm -hmm. We need to stop being religious and start being righteous. Right. We need to walk in the freedom of the Spirit. And this is the instruction on that. Whatever was written in earlier times, Paul said, was written for our instruction. So we're all going to go into this to find the instruction on how to live that true freedom and to touch, be used by God, available to God, to be used by Him, to touch other lives for that freedom. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can use us. Lord, in all of our foolishness and all of our humanity and all of our failure, Lord God, that you can use us, that you can work in us and through us for the glory of your name. But Lord, it's my great, great desire that I would grow in my knowledge of you, my understanding of your word, and that everybody here would also share in that blessing. Hallelujah. We want to be pleasing to you, Lord God. That is our great and grand desire, is to please you. Yes, Lord. So Father, we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. 
Well, be with us again next week because we're going to come back. We're going to we're going to go through Galatians a little bit faster. But remember, the purpose is to set us up and prepare us for that teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. You need to know the pitfalls, okay? And that's in Galatians. The pitfalls are definitely in Galatians. <laughs> so until next week, I pray that God will bless you and use you for the glory of His name. Amen. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. Yes, we will. God bless you and goodbye. Bye. Bye. See you.